Do you know that the passwords you create on most websites are not actually stored on the website servers in a text format? As you may know, many people use the same password for multiple accounts on many websites. So your password is stored on a website servers, and then these servers got hacked. Then, the hacker can access all your other accounts with the same password. So to protect users from hackers, most websites store users' passwords as hashes. You may be wondering, what is this hash, and how do you log in if your password is stored like this? Also, what does all of this have to do with crypto? Well, you will get answers to all these questions in a minute, but first. Welcome to Cryptobee, where we explain cryptocurrencies and DeFi topics in the most simple and beginner-friendly way. In this video, you will know what is a cryptographic hashing function, some important characteristics of secure hashing functions, and then we will get to where and how these hashing functions are used in crypto, so let's get started. So, what is a hash function? Well, to answer this question, let's return to our passwords example. Now looking at this hash, you may be thinking that these are some random letters and numbers. But actually they are not random at all. This hash comes from putting your password into a hashing function. This hashing function is like a black box that works using some very complex math to convert any data you give it into a hash, which is simply a series of letters and numbers. You can give it any type of data, a word, an entire book, an image, or an audio file. Also, it doesn't matter the length or the size of the data, it will always give you a hash of the same length. For example, the hash of an entire book is the same length as the hash of the single letter C. An important point to understand here is that like what we said, any hash you get is not random at all. It is like using math to summarize the data you give it. So if you input the same data a million times into the same hashing function, you will always get the same hash, it will not change, no matter how many times you try. Another important thing you need to understand is that cryptographic hash functions are one way only. So you can never reverse a hash to get the input data. If for example, we give you this hash, there is nothing you can do to get the input data. You can only try to guess by trying many many different inputs, and it is still pointless as it is almost impossible for you to guess the input data that generated a specific hash. By the way, it was hit the like button if you have been enjoying the video hashed with the SHA-256 hashing function. So, returning back to the passwords example, like what we said, passwords are stored on the server as hashes. So that, even if the server was attacked, the hacker still won't be able to know any real passwords. So, how do you log in then? Well, when you are trying to log in, any password you try will be put into the hashing function to generate a hash. This new hash will be then compared with the hash stored on the server. If the hash generated is the same as the hash stored on the server, then you will successfully log in. But if the generated hash is different, then you will get the incorrect password message and you won't be able to access the account. Now let's get back to the hashing functions. So there are many different types of hashing functions or algorithms like the MD family, the SHA family, and the RIPE MD family. The SHA-256 is currently the most commonly used function in crypto as it is still very secure, and the SHA-3 function released in 2015 is the most secure hashing function. But it is slower than the SHA-256 and not supported by many applications and hardware. Each hashing function you choose to use will give you a different hash with a different length for the same input data. For example, hashes generated with the MD5 hashing function will be composed of 32 letters and numbers. So, any data you input in MD5, no matter its length or size, will give you a 32-character hash. If you put in a word, it will give you 32 letters and numbers. And if you put in an entire book, it will still give you 32 letters and numbers. But on the other hand, the SHA-256, for example, will give you hashes composed of 64 letters and numbers for any data you give it. Before we get to how these hash functions are used in crypto, there are two very important points you need to understand. First, you should know that changing anything in the input data will give you an entirely different hash. For example, if you are hashing a word, any slight change like replacing a small letter with a capital letter will give you a totally different hash. If your input data is an image, even changing tiny pixels will give you an entirely different hash. The other important thing you need to understand is that for a hashing function to be secure, it has to be collision-resistant, 
which simply means that you can't find two different inputs that will give you the same hash. This is very important as hashing functions are used in digital signatures. If there is a hashing function with two different inputs that can give you the same hash, then its security is broken and it can be used by attackers to change the documents or files that you digitally sign on. For example, a scammer may take a check that you digitally signed and edit the check amount, and then using some special techniques, he can still generate the same hash as the original check, which means that your digital signature is valid on the modified check as well. So that is why when collisions are found in a hashing function, we stop using it, as it is considered insecure, and that is what happened with the MD5 and the SHA-1 hashing functions. A point that may surprise you here is that all cryptographic hashing functions have collisions, but it should be very very hard, almost impossible to find them. Now, let's get to where and how these hashing functions are used in crypto. So, first of all, hashing functions are used to generate your public address on the Bitcoin and Ethereum blockchains. You may know that your crypto wallet stores your public key and your private key. Your public key is a series of letters and numbers that you can share with anyone to send you crypto. Your private key is also a series of 64 letters and numbers that allow you to spend or use the crypto you have, so it should always be kept private from anyone. What you may not know here is that the wallet address you see and use on Bitcoin or Ethereum is not your actual public key, but the hashed version of it. In Bitcoin, for example, your public key is hashed with SHA-256, and then the hash we get is hashed again with the ripe MD160 hashing function. In Ethereum, on the other hand, your public key is hashed one time with the Kekchak-256 function, and then only the last 40 characters of the hash we get are used as your public key. You may be wondering, why do we hash the public keys at the first place? Well, public keys are hashed to get a shorter version of them that is easier to give to other users. Some people think that hashing the public keys can help improve security. If the elliptic curve algorithm was attacked, which is the encryption algorithm we use to generate our public and private keys. Another use of hashing functions is in hashing transactions on the blockchain. On Bitcoin and Ethereum, all the transactions are hashed, and the hashes we get act like IDs for these transactions. So, instead of searching for transaction number 1157 in block number 114,562, you can get the transaction details by simply searching for its hash, which is known as transaction ID. Still, this is not the only use for transaction hashes or IDs, as they are also used in generating something called a Merkle tree. Merkle trees allow us to have a cryptographic proof of the transactions included in each block and their order. For example, let's say we have a Bitcoin block that has only eight transactions. So, we will hash the transactions to get their hashes or IDs. After that, we will take each pair of sibling transaction hashes and hash them together again to get four new hashes. Then, we will do the same thing with these four hashes to get two new hashes. Finally, we will hash the last two hashes together to get a new hash called the root hash or the Merkle root. This Merkle root summarizes all the eight transactions included in the block, and it gets included in the header of the block. So each block header in Bitcoin includes a Merkle root of all the transactions included in the block, which can be up to 2,500 transactions or sometimes more. Any attempts to slightly change or try to reverse previous transactions in a previous block will totally change the Merkle root, and it will be different from the one included in in the header, which means that the block will be invalid. Merkle trees also allow computers on the Bitcoin network to verify if a specific transaction was included in a previous block or not. Without downloading all the block's data, the block headers alone are enough, which are way smaller in size than the entire block's data. For example, if we want to verify that transaction number 4 was included in this block, we take the hash of the transaction and try to find the path to the Merkle root. In this situation, we will need the hash of transaction 3, so we can combine it with hash 4, we have to get hash 3 4. We also need hash 1 2 and only the combined hash 5 6 7 8 from the other side. Using these hashes, we can get the Merkle root. If we get the same Merkle root included in the block header, then the transaction was actually included in the block. Now, we can't talk about hashing functions without talking about proof of work. So in proof of work, what happens is that computers on the network called miners have to verify transactions and add new blocks to the blockchain. For a block to be accepted, the miner has to generate a hash that starts with a specific number of zeros. For example, the network may require the hash to start with five zeros or seven zeros. 
The more zeros at the beginning, the more difficult it gets to the minors, and this number changes frequently. So, a minor will take the block header, which includes the Merkle root and other important information about the block, add to it a random number called the nonce, and then put all of this into the SHA-256 hashing function to get a hash. If the generated hash doesn't start with the required number of zeros, then the miner has to try again. This process is known as mining. So the miner will change the nonce and try again as many times as it takes to get a correct hash. All the miners on the network are constantly trying to get a correct hash, and the first miner who actually succeeds will get his block added to the blockchain and will be rewarded with new bitcoins. This search for hashes requires spending a lot of money on hardware and energy, so it makes trying to add blocks to the blockchain very expensive. This mechanism makes it extremely hard for an attacker to add his invalid block to the blockchain, as he will need to buy very expensive hardware and run it for years to get his block rejected at the end by the other computers on the network, so he will lose all the money he spent. Now, when a miner adds a new block to the blockchain, the correct hash he generated will be added to the header of the next block, so all the blocks are connected together in a chain, where each block header contains the hash of the previous block. So it is not possible to change anything or reverse any transactions in a previous block, as slightly changing anything in a previous block will change its hash, so it will be different from the hash included in the next block. Which means that the attacker will need to mine all the following blocks alone, which is an impossible thing to do, as it requires enormous computing power that no one can currently buy in the case of Bitcoin or Ethereum. At the end of this video, we hope you learned what you need to know about the cryptographic hashing functions and how they are used in crypto, and if you liked our video and want to reward our hard work, hit the like button, let us know in the comments if you have any questions or video ideas, and subscribe to our channel and turn on the notifications so you don't miss our new videos. Thanks for watching.